Hey guys, today we're going to talk about cross-coupling reactions and a few principles you have to know in order to understand them right. So cross-coupling reactions are a powerful tool in modern synthesis because they allow the formation of CC single bonds between two different kinds of molecules. We're going to look at the basic scheme right here and we're going to look at each component individually. So we'll start with Rx, which X is a leaving group, which can be either an halide, so like chloride, bromide or iodide. And R stands for an organic rest, about which kind of rest we are talking about. That's something we will discuss later, but just keep in mind, it's an organic rest and it has to be a carbon, which is bonded to the leaving group. So this part right here will be our electrophile because the carbon is partially positively charged. So here you can see some examples about what I'm talking about. On the other hand, we have our nucleophile. RM stands for an, any kind of organometallic reagent, such as Grignard reagents, but later we'll see that it can be also with tin or even boron. The key is that it has a negatively charged carbon in it. So this can act as a nucleophile. The organic rest can be literally anything in this case. It only matters for the electrophile, which kind of organic rest it is. So if you try to draw a reaction from this electrophile and this nucleophile, it seems quite reasonable to make it look like an SN1, SN2 type reaction. But in reality, this reaction doesn't really occur because of a low yield and too many side reactions which can take place. So the key is to take a um, catalyst. The catalyst in our case is palladium. Palladium is the most common catalyst in cross-coupling reactions, but there are also nickel catalysts and iron catalysts, which are used in modern synthesis. But we are just going to focus on palladium. The most important thing is that it's in the oxidation state zero. So in the reaction, if we want our catalyst to be in a complex, we have to use neutral ligands such as triphenylphosphine. So now as we introduce our catalyst, the reaction also doesn't take place as SN1, SN2 either, but as a catalytic cycle, we are going to talk about later. But first we have to talk about palladium at first. So palladium is in the 10th group of the periodic table. Its most common oxidation states are zero and plus two. In the plus two oxidation state, it still has eight D electrons, so it's a D8 system. So as a D8 system, it coordinates in a square plane geometry. If we look at palladium zero with 10 electrons, we see that it also has to coordinate four ligands because then it will fulfill the 18 electron rule. An example for this is the tetrakis triphenylphosphine palladium zero complex. This complex is stable as it has every bonding site it has bounded to a ligand, but also because of the 18 electron rule. So if you want any catalytic activity from it, it has to dissociate at least two of its ligands. This is what's going to happen in an equilibrium. One after another will dissociate and we will get a linear complex, which is now very reactive because it has three bonding sites. As in palladium zero system, it is very electron rich. So it means it can easily give away some electrons by oxidation and go to a palladium two state. And this is exactly what happens in the catalytic cycle as we change from oxidation state zero to ox oxidation state two and back. So if we say the first step to our mechanism is the dissociation of two legions, then it will look like this. And now as we have our very reactive palladium zero complex, the first step is an oxidation from palladium zero to palladium two, but it's not only an oxidation, it's an oxidative addition. So which means we'll take our electrophile, which was our organic halide, and the palladium will now insert between the halide and the carbon. And as the palladium is oxidized via this step, the carbon on the other hand is reduced. So we now have a negatively charged carbon next to a palladium. And you can kind of think of this as when you try to make a Grignard reagent for which you also use an organic halide and you use magnesium and it will insert right in between the carbon and the halide. So as an intermediate in our cycle, we have this palladium two complex, which now undergoes the transmetallation. The transmetallation is a step in which we now use our nucleophile, which is in our case a Grignard reagent. What happens is two legions change the metal they are bonded to. In this case, we have a phenyl group, which changes from being bonded to the magnesium to being bonded to the palladium. And the bromide legion does the exact opposite because now it will bond to the magnesium bromide, which can now precipitate. So the transmetallation step is actually the weight determining step. So it basically means it is the slowest of all the steps we are going to look at. I will talk about it later about why it's important. So if we look at this intermediate, we have two organic ligands bonded in transposition to the palladium catalyst. The next step is very fast and is in trans cis isomerization. This step is important because the next step is kind of a counterpart to the oxidative addition and it's the reductive elimination. The reductive elimination is concerted, which means it goes in one step and can therefore not occur if the two legions are trans to each other. 
And this is the step we will get our product from. The two organic legions are going to form a single bond and give the palladium two electrons back so it will be reduced to palladium zero again and can now start another catalytic cycle again. So now we have our full cycle. In the meantime I would like to kindly ask you to subscribe to my channel and leave this video a thumbs up to support my channel. So we are going to quickly summarize what we talked about. For cross-coupling reactions you need a nucleophile, an electrophile and a metallic catalyst which is usually palladium in the oxidation state zero. During the reaction palladium changes its oxidation state from zero to two and back. The catalytic cycle of common cross-coupling reactions consists of the oxidative addition, the transmetallation, the trans-cis isomerization and the reductive elimination. So if you have read something about cross-coupling reactions before, you may have seen that in the lab you don't work with a palladium zero complex that you give into the solution. You usually give a catalyst precursor into the solution, which is a palladium two complex. This can for instance be the dichloride bis triphenylphosphine palladium two complex. This is as palladium zero complexes are not air stable, so it's a better way to use a palladium two complex, which is stable on the air so it's easier to work with, and make it to a palladium zero complex in the solution. So we do this by using 3-ethylamine and reduce it to palladium zero, but you can also use other reagents here. Then the first step is a simple legend exchange reaction. So one chloride legend dissociates and the 3 ethylamine binds to the palladium with its free electron pair. The next step is what's called a beta hydride elimination. So the carbon in better position to the palladium has an hydrogen bonded to it. It can then migrate as a hydride to perform an elimination which forms a double bond which will then form an imine in this case. And now the hydride ligand binds to the palladium. As you can imagine, the next step is also a reductive elimination from which hydrogen chloride will eliminate, reducing the palladium back to oxidation state zero, which gives us our active catalyst. So as you can see, in a simple way, we can create the catalyst inside the solution, so it is just easier to work with. So now let's talk about some simple cross-coupling reactions. I will start with the Kumada cross-coupling reaction. We basically just talked about it all the time because the reaction I showed you, we used a Grignard reagent as a nucleophile. And all the reactions we are going to talk about only change in the nucleophile we use. We always use an halide, but the nucleophile is always a different kind of organometallic species, as we are going to see. So the Kamada cross-coupling reaction is pretty simple because you can easily make Grignard reagents, but on the downside it lacks a tolerance of functional groups. So it means that if one of your coupling partners has, let's say, an aldehyde group in it, the reaction won't take place because the Grignard reagent is so reactive and it will only add to the aldehyde group. And same goes for slightly acidic groups. So also you have to work in inert conditions because Grignard reagents are really sensitive when it comes to hydrolysis from air moisture. If you want a slightly less reactive organometallic species, then we can talk about the Nagishi cross-coupling reactions. The Nagishi cross-coupling reaction uses organic zinc reagents, which are slightly less reactive than Grignard reactions, but so also don't work very well with many kinds of functional groups. The only upside is on the next step we are going to talk about organotin reagents, which are way more toxic than organozinc reagents. So the reaction which uses organotin reagents is the Stille coupling. Organotin reagents are not very reactive towards other functional groups. The Stille coupling can also be performed in water in some cases, which makes the reaction really cheap to perform. But the downside is that, as I said, it's really toxic, but as it is a good alternative to the Komada cross-coupling, it's widely used in modern synthesis. As you can see, the reactivity of the used organometallic agents changes as we have a more covalent type bond between the carbon and the metal we use. So it all comes down to the difference in between electronegativity between the carbon and the metal. And we will go even further and we will now use organoboron reagents, which basically have a covalent character, which makes the Suzuki coupling reaction very widely used as is tolerant against almost every functional group. The downside is that as it is not that reactive, you often have to use high temperatures or long reaction times in order for the reaction to succeed. But as you can use water as a solvent, it makes the reaction very economic and environmentally friendly, so it plays a lead role in green chemistry and is often used in modern synthesis. So as you can see, if you have a very simple molecule, which doesn't have any functional groups, despite the ones you need to perform a cross-coupling reaction, then you could easily go and perform a Kumada cross-coupling. But if you have a very complex molecule, which is often found in 
modern total synthesis, then you would rather go to the Suzuki or the Stiller coupling because they are the most tolerant against other functional groups. And also the Suzuki and Stiller coupling are really cheap if you can perform them in aqueous solution. So now as we have a brief introduction into what's possible with cross-coupling reactions, we have to talk about a limitation cross-coupling reactions have. And as I always said, it doesn't really matter what's, what the organic rest is on the nucleophile, but on the electrophile we can't have an alkyl group as an organic rest. And this is because, as I said, the rate determining slab or the very slow step in this reaction is the transmetallation. And the reason why we can't use alkyl groups on the electrophile is because of the better hydrate elimination which can occur. So if you think about it, after oxidative addition, it takes some time for the transmetallation to occur because this step is really slow. And if it competes with the intermolecular better hydrate elimination, the, be the elimination will always win because it's way faster. So to prevent this, we can't have an hydrogen attached to an sp3 carbon in better position to the palladium catalyst which basically means that we can use organic compounds like this, but not compounds like this. So as you're now starting to become an expert in cross-coupling reactions, I want to show you some coupling reactions, which kind of changed scheme we talked about, but as you can see, they are also really simple to understand, even if we have to encode one new reaction. So the first one I want to show you is the Sonogashiwa cross-coupling reaction. The mechanism looks quite complex, but in reality, it's also the same as in the Kumala cross-coupling, but the only difference is that it will create an organometallic compound in the solution. So in this case, we are making a cuprate by deprotonation of an alkene. As you may know, alkenes are quite acidic as the terminal carbon is sp hybridized, which means that after deprotonation, the negative charge will be in an orbital which is 50% like an s orbital, and S orbitals are quite near to the positively charged nucleus, which will then stabilize the negative charge. So if we go to this reaction, the first step is the same as in every other cross-coupling reaction, but on the transmetallation, we are connecting to another cycle in which we have a copper catalyzed reaction, and the copper basically has the purpose to increase the acidity of the alkene by taking off some electron density of the pi bonds, and then deprotonating it, creating a corporate in solution which can then undergo the transmetallation as usual. But also the coupling reactions isn't restricted to carbon-carbon bonding, we can also perform carbon-nitrogen bonding as in the buckwald hardwick amination. So in this case the nucleophile is an amine, which can also bond on the palladium catalyst, but in this case it's a bit different because the reaction can only occur if the palladium catalyst only binds to one legion. So the mechanism is also quite simple and you can also use the same schemes as we did before, but the only difference is that we don't have a transmetallation step, of course, because uh, we don't have an organometallic compound in here. And the last example we want to talk about is the heck coupling. The heck coupling is actually really useful because you can basically perform a substitution at alkenes and it also at Michael systems. On the heck coupling, there isn't a transmetallation taking place, but a carbometallation which basically looks like this. We have our product of our oxidative addition and after a ligand dissociates, the palladium will create a pi bonding to an olefin, which is just a simple alkene in this case. And as the C palladium sigma bond is really reactive towards C double bonds, the C C sigma bond will insert between the palladium and the organic rest R, which was already bonded to the palladium. As the complex has a free bonding site, again, the 3 phenylphosphine ligand will again bond and we will have this product. And the next step again is a better hydrate elimination. So after that we will get our eliminated product, which is again an olefin and an hydrate palladium complex, which then can easily undergo reductive elimination to recycle the palladium catalyst. Well, this should be enough at first. I hope I could help you with this video. If you have any questions regarding cross-coupling reactions or organic chemistry in general, just leave me a comment and I will answer as quickly as I can. Thank you for tuning in and goodbye.